Good evening. I'm Barbie Zelizer, director of the Scholars Program, and I'm being prompted for a password here. Am I going to hurt anything? Okay, okay. Good evening. I'm happy to welcome you here to tonight's lecture. Finding the right context for an academic project is supposed to come from mixing intellect, skill, and experience. But those on the inside know that it also comes from a stroke of uh, really good luck. And Fred Turner is one really lucky guy. Time and again, he's produced smart, convincing, and provocative explanations for a wide range of uh, uh, historical phenomena, introducing pieces of odd contexts to each other and making it seem like they always belong together. So we learned from his work that responses to the Vietnam War revealed a nation mired in classic signs of PTSD, that cyber culture owes its ascent to 60s uh, counterculture, that computer science helps journalists act as better governmental watchdogs, and that cameras and guns together keep the poor and people of color as viable threats in TV's reality-based crime shows, and that Burning Man offers a model infrastructure for new media productions. If you're wondering what these all have to do with each other, join me. Uh, but in each case, <laughs> Turner takes a familiar phenomenon, he shifts it backward and forward in time, he turns it inside and out of its recognized boundaries, and as luck would have it, he shows us news what, new ways of seeing what we always thought we knew before. Turner's unusual intellectual choices uh, draw from his multifaceted background. He's been both a journalist and an academic. He's worked in both the humanities and the social sciences. Armed with two degrees in English and American literature, a BA from Brown, an MA from Columbia, he switched to communication for his PhD while at University of California at San Diego, uh, worked for a while in the greater Boston area, one must mention MIT and Harvard, uh, and then settled at Stanford University where he's now an associate professor of communication and director of the program in science, technology, and society author of two books and over 30 articles, book chapters and reviews. He's given over 75 invited lectures and has won multiple honors and awards, ranging from the Bennett Surf Prize for Best Poetry, Pro Prose, or Drama. I bet you didn't think I would say that. I yeah. wasn't going to go there at all, no. Two fellowships from both the Teagle Foundation and Stanford University's Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. His last book, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, Stuart Brand, The Whole Earth Catalog and the Rise of Digital Utopianism, won four separate book awards, including a publishing award for excellence from the Association of American uh, Publishers. So it's no surprise that in a very short time, his work has been translated into French, Spanish, and German. For the past two years, Turner has been hard at work applying that mix of intellect, skill, and experience to a new project, tentatively titled The Democratic Surround, How World War II America Shaped the Politics of Multimedia. And his talk tonight, The Family of Man and the Politics of Attention in Cold War America, draws from a piece of that project. He was lucky in getting there, but we're lucky to have him here. So please wow. welcome him. Thank you. Oh, dang. Um, thank you, Barbie. Thank you, Amber School, for having me here. Um, thank you, Sharona Pearl, for making it possible. And thank you, Emily Plowman, for keeping everything together. I really appreciate it. Um, can everybody hear me OK? OK. Might want to turn down the mic a little bit, because as I get excited, I get louder. So get a little less volume on the mic. Less, less, less. Great. Thanks. Um, and then um, I'm going to also. Um, take off my jacket because I'm just a whole lot more comfortable lecturing in my um, shirt sleeves. No more. <laughs> uh, this might be a tougher crowd than I thought. Um, so, so I'm very excited to present this work tonight. Um, this is a very new project. Um, I haven't given this talk very often, actually just I think twice in my life before. Um, and it's, it's from a paper that will be coming out in, in the spring. Um, in the journal Public Culture, uh, which John Jackson is a, an editor in. Um, 
and I'm excited about that. Um, so I actually want to use this opportunity to do a, a formal presentation for 40, 45 minutes, but also to think with you on a couple of the topics. Um, and I'm particularly going to ask us to think together about what the politics of attention might mean. Uh, I'm going to take us back into a historical setting, work through the family of man, talk about that. But then I'm going to try to pull it back at the end with some ruminations on the contemporary scene. Um, let me start with a bit of a story. As Barbie mentioned, uh, I did a book um, called From Counterculture to Cyberculture about the ways that the American counterculture shaped our understanding of the possibilities of small-scale technologies, computing technology, um, particularly the ideas of personalization around computing and virtual community. So in the course of doing that book, I bumped into a 1960s that wasn't supposed to be there. I thought the 1960s were a time when an entire generation rebelled against its parents, turned away from technology, turned toward drugs, um, moved off into the back of the land space, and, and left the 40s and 50s behind. And I thought that the 40s and 50s were dark, gray decades um, you know, of, of um, what Elaine May has called containment culture. I thought they were about psychological and social containment. Um, you know, with, with the witch trials, McCarthyite witch trials being, being their emblem. Um, imagine my surprise when I started rummaging in Stuart Brand's materials around the Whole Earth catalog and found instead that one of his favorite thinkers was Norbert Wiener, a World War II and Cold War military theorist um, and mathematician. Um, imagine my surprise when I saw that the psychologists of the 40s, people like Eric Fromm, were in fact heroes to the children of the 60s. And when I got that last book done and needed to kind of get underway with another, um, I, I'm kind of built that way. I'm like a long distance runner. I'm not happy if I'm not out on some weird trail. I need to get back on the trail. I started rummaging back there in the stuff from the 40s and the 50s. And the current book, I think, is a book that's a prequel in many ways to the last one. Um, it starts in the late 30s, ends in the late 60s. And it makes the case that in the early 1940s, in a way that I'm about to describe, um, American intellectuals, American artists, made a turn away from mass media toward the celebration of multi-screen, multi-source, immersive media, media environments. These media environments were designed at the time explicitly for the production of democratic personalities to help the nation survive the onslaught of fascism and later communism. Those multimedia environments, I'm going to give you the whole book right here, in the late 1960s become psychedelia. Okay. So that's the, that's, that's the big project. I want to go inside um, the family of man, though, because the family of man is something that, um, in many ways, shouldn't have had the impact that it had. I'm going to ask three questions. I'm going to just ask first what the family of man was. In one hand, it was a photo exhibition, but on the other hand, it was an international phenomenon. I'm going to turn, then, to the question of where it came from. There's a kind of heroic story about Edward Steichen, the photographer and curator of the Museum of Modern Art, bringing forth the family of man out of his genius. And I'm going to dispute that story and make quite a different case. And when I make that case, I'm going to argue that it reveals a politics of attention that emerged in the Cold War just where we would least expect to find it, that has since served as a kind of framework through which we understand ubiquitous media, especially multimedia today, um, and it helps give rise to our own consumer-oriented, person-centered media culture. So that's the arc of the talk. OK, so what was the family of man? Um, I'm looking around the room. Has anyone seen the family of man installed? Anybody here? OK, that gives me a lot of license. Oh, Monroe, maybe? <laughs> OK, so, 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 so that's good. I got, I've, got, I've got some license. Um, the family of man was an exhibition of 503 images at the Museum of Modern Art, shown um, in 1955, soon after the Korean War. It's the most popular photography exhibition, I think, of all time. A quarter of a million people came to see it at the Museum of Modern Art. It filled the entire second floor of the museum. Five copies were then produced, and they traveled around the world. According to the United States Information Agency, which sponsored their travels, more than 7.5 million people saw the show on the road. A book was published. The book. Uh, went on to sell more than 5 million copies. It's still in print today. Uh, you know, simply an astonishing, an astonishing sort of event. Um, that's the open gateway, by the way, um, to the museum. And here you see some of the, 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 way, that the way that it looked on the road. Um, this is the book. I'm, I'm willing to bet that some of you grew up with this book on your shelf. 
I know I did. Absolutely. Yep. And it was ubiquitous. Literally, almost every American family had this book in, in the house. Um, here's the poster. Keep, keep in mind as I go through the talk this phrase, the show you see with your heart. That's going to be important in a little bit. And here's a crowd lined up. I, I don't actually remember which site this is. But it gives you a feel for the way the crowds would mass for the Family of Man exhibition when it hit the road. You know, really just extraordinary, both in the United States and overseas. Uh, the show, by the way, is still on display at a castle in Clairvaux, um, in Luxembourg. There's a permanent exhibition of the Family of Man, um, original images at Clairvaux Castle in Clairvaux, Luxembourg. Um, so, ironically, as popular as it was, or perhaps because it was as popular as it was, the Family of Man has been a critical whipping boy for mid-century aesthetics, top to bottom. Um, here's one of my favorite whippers, Roland Barth. Um, I, you know, I, I love this picture because he just looks ever so slightly smug. Um, you know, I, I know the truth, yeah. Okay. So, um, and it, it's, it's been beaten up on a couple of accounts. It's been, been universally beaten up by scholars who came of age in the 70s and 80s. It's been accused of um, being racist, of depicting people of color as somehow more impoverished, weaker, um, less attractive than the white folks in the show. Um, that's actually not true. I, I, we can go deep on that if we need to. It's been depicted as colonialist, as part of an American enterprise to export a kind of universal American humanism abroad and so enforce our national will. And in that sense, it's also been decried as imperialist. Two aesthetic elements are driving that critique. One is the notion that this show was like a Life magazine um, photo essay written large. The key point here is that Folks who critique the, uh, the exhibition for being a story told through pictures. And I'm going to make a case in a moment that it wasn't that at all. And it's an important case because the story encodes, a, the story that it was a story, encodes a model of power, a model of influence that aligns the exhibition with propaganda. And that's not what it was. Second, critics have attacked the show for its imagery, which is as you know, probably snapshot heavy, very realistic photographic imagery. It's not um, abstract. There are only two abstractions out of the 303, 503 images. Um, very, very realistic. And you know, folks have, have hit that for being um, very middle brown. Um, the essay that summed up the critiques um, was published by Russell Linz, who's a journalist and later a book writer, in 1973. This is how he described the show. He said, it's a vast photo essay. A literary formula, basically, with much of the emotional and visual quality provided by the sheer bigness of the blow-ups and its rather sententious message sharpened by juxtaposition of opposites. Wheat fields and landscapes of boulders, peasants and patricians, a sort of a, look at all these nice folks in all these strange places who belong to this family. Wow. OK. That's a tough critique. And that's really, I think, a, a nice summary of, of the critique. Um, that's been out there for, from that generation. So that critique, in turn, depends on a canonical story of where the exhibition comes from and how it was created. And that story starts with this man, Edward Steichen, who was 70 years old when he started mounting the show. Um, he was a photographer in the early part of the 20th century, did a lot of commercial work, um, kind of a post-photo secessionist, then went on to do nice, clean magazine work. During World War II, he headed up, he, he, he headed up a photographic unit for the American Navy was fond ever after of being called Captain Steichen, um, even by his wife. Um, it's a complicated story. Wasn't going to go there. OK, so Edward Steichen, um, you know, and he, he was an interesting guy. Um, he, he was the brother-in-law of Carl Sandburg, which also becomes important in a moment. And from 1947 to 62, he was the director of photography at the Museum of Modern Art, the first director of photography at the museum. Um, he had done three shows, uh, two during World War II and one during the Korean War, that were, were very important to his developing the family of man. The first, which I'll talk about a lot in a moment, was called Road to Victory in 1942. It was a straight up propaganda show. Second, Power in the Pacific, 1945, same deal. And then the third was about Korea. It was Korea, the impact of war in photographs from 1951. And it's interesting. When he was asked why he came to do The Family of Man, he said it was because he had failed to stop war with his previous exhibitions. Now, we may think that's a little grandiose to imagine that you can stop war with a couple of museum exhibitions, but he really believed it. And this is what he said. He said, although I had presented war in all its grimness in three exhibitions, I had failed to accomplish my mission. 
I had not incited people into taking open and united action against war itself. What was wrong? I came to the conclusion that I had been working from a negative approach, that what was needed was a positive statement on what a wonderful thing life was, how marvelous people were, and above all, how alike people were in all parts of the world. Right. Now, um, once he had that vision, Steichen famously began sorting through two million images. He reached out to his photography friends, people like Dorothea Lang, who in turn wrote to their friends, recruiting images for the show. Um, they, he went through FSA, Foreign Security Administration archives, Life Magazine archives, Newsweek archives, on through. Um, Winnered it down himself to about 10,000 images, and then moved to uh, a loft in the upper 50s uh, with his assistant, Wayne Miller. And together, they winnowed those 10,000 down to 503 images. And this entire process um, was documented in, in magazine pieces and in museum documents about the show, um, and it was very much promoted as, as the notion that Steichen himself had authored this show. He'd authored it through a process of selection, but he had authored it. It was his story. And that's the idea that's come down to us, that this was a story told by a genius uh, who happened to work in a museum, happened to have put these images together um, by aggregating them. Um, but that because it's a story told by a genius who was affiliated with propaganda before then during World War II, and because it was then distributed by the United States Information Agency, we should regard this as a species of oppressive imagery. I think if we actually go back to the history of the show, we'll see both a different history and the need for a very different reading. Um, in point of fact, the exhibition grows out of a World War II push against fascism and mass media. It draws not simply on Life Magazine aesthetics, but rather on Bauhaus aesthetics, and very specifically on what were then very current theories of something called the democratic personality. I'll, I'll quote and describe those in a moment. And it was designed by Steichen and the installation team to liberate the senses of viewers, politically and psychologically both. And those two things were entwined. Um, how do we think about the entwining of psychology and politics and media in this period? Well, the late 1930s, we had a problem. Actually, we had several problems. Um, fascism had come to power in Germany and in Italy. We had communism in Russia. And there was a tremendous fear that mass media themselves had somehow brought about and empowered dictators. That cinema, radio, even the newspaper served as mouthpieces, megaphones, for these mad dictators who could literally communicate their madness to us across these channels. Mass media themselves were imagined as having, as I think this poster shows, a penetrating sort of power. They come beaming in, shoo, cut through the walls, the walls of your mind in particular, and literally stop your reason from working, reach down, put your newly discovered Freudian unconscious, which I keep in my tummy, um, in play, um, and, and get it all stirred up. And once they get it all stirred up, cause you to become part of an unreasoning mass. And that's what Hitler seemed to have gotten organized, was an unreasoning mass that would now follow him. Um, now, we don't remember this, but at the time, FDR was thought to potentially be a fascist as well. It was routinely called one, especially in the early part of his career. In fact, in the very earliest days, when he was running for office the first time, um, he sounded not a little like someone who was going to take a dictatorial kind of charge of the nation. And, and we forget that in the early 30s, even in the late 20s, dictatorship wasn't necessarily a negative in America. You may not know that in 1927, I believe it was Buick, I may get the company wrong, um, released a family sedan called The Dictator. Scary, huh? Known for its power on the road. No joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're go we'll, we'll go there in a minute. But meantime, I thought you might enjoy this image as well of Hermann Goering. Um, I think this is a nice illustration of this idea of the mad fascist leader using communication channels, particularly electronic mass media, to communicate his madness out to people, turn off their reason, and charge their internal emotional lives in such a way that they became fascists. Now, again, I, I want to really emphasize the threat of fascism in the late 1930s is not only in Germany, Italy, and Europe. It's here in the United States. It's here in England. These are British fascists from the late 1930s in Devon, England. You can see there are quite a number of them. And 
people began to wonder, how is it that we can explain the potential threat of fascism, the potential rise of fascism, not only in Germany or Italy, but here in the United States? Two broad theories came into play. Um, the first was that economic disorder brought about by the forces of industrialization, mo modernity broadly, had begun to break down the psyche. People had begun to kind of fall apart psychologically. This was doubly true in the Depression in the United States and the Weimar Republic in Germany. They'd also suffered, of course, during World War I. Finally, mass media as the tools of modernity seemed to provide a way to communicate the deranged ideas of the leader to these otherwise weakened masses in such a way that they were likely to follow them. And again, I, I really want to emphasize that this is an American problem in this period, too. Um, imagine my surprise when I was reading through a February 1939 issue of Life magazine and found a photo spread on a Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden. Guess how many people were there? 22,000 Americans in February of 1939. That's what, five months before Hitler goes into Poland? Not, not long. Well, in fact, I forget my dates, but it's, he's already, you know. American fascism was real. There were Nazi summer camps on Long Island. There are pictures of people in American Nazi uniforms picnicking in Life magazine. Now, they're ridiculed, but they're ubiquitous. Father Coughlin, Father Charles Coughlin, um, a demagogue who I think might not be entirely out of place in the America of today, but an anti-Semite, um, reached three and a half million Americans every week on his radio program. In 1937, uh, the Gallup uh, organization did a poll and discovered that 65% of the listeners agreed with his views. Now, I, I think it's important to remember that America, you know, as Sinclair Lewis, I think, put it, what, you know, it, it could happen here. So there's a tremendous fear that it really could happen here as it seemed to have just happened in England and that mass media would help that be the case. So as America enters World War II, it has a problem and its leaders have a problem. On the one hand, we want to gin up excitement about going to war. We need to meet the fascist challenge. On the other hand, we don't want to turn our citizens into those kind of numb, unthinking masses that seem to have arisen elsewhere. Um, we, people came to believe, had a democratic character. How could we promote that? How could we promote that? So um, two groups went, went to work on this rather quickly. Um, my, my favorite um, was the Committee for National Morale. Again, it seems to have slipped from our public memory. I'm not sure why. It might have been because it was founded by an art historian, Arthur Upham Pope a Persian art expert in New York. But it included all kinds of eminent folks, about 70 of them, uh, journalists Edmund Taylor and Ladislas Farago, uh, psychologists Gordon Allport and Kurt Lewin, anthropologists Ruth Benedict, Gregory Bateson, and Margaret Mead. I mean, it's really quite a high-powered group. Um, and this group gathered together, in part at the Museum of Modern Art and then at various restaurants in New York, and came to the notion that the democratic character, as they defined it, should serve as the basis for an American style of unity that would be distinct from the fascist style of unity. And this is what Allport said um, about, about American style of unity. He's writing in 1942. He says, in a democracy, every personality can be a citadel of resistance to tyranny. In the coordination of the intelligences and wills of 100 million whole men and women lies the formula for an invincible American morale. What's intriguing here is that he sees personality as what we're fighting for. And other psychologists would say that directly. We need to make the kinds of whole people that Weimar Germany and the American, America during the Depression seem to have lost track of. We need to not turn our citizens into fascists. Allport and the group around the Committee for National Morale were terrific theorists. They wrote a great deal about this. They actually served as advisors to President Roosevelt. Margaret Mead, in particular, spent time talking to FDR. Um, you know, they were very, very active. They wrote books, um, but they didn't make media. Uh, they weren't media makers by and large. Um, for that, they needed to turn to the Bauhaus. The late 1930s was a time when Bauhaus refugees flocked to Manhattan and they needed work. And when they got here, they arrived with very developed theories of how media should work, uh, particularly media in an environmental circumstance. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. You know, the Bauhaus, there's a lot going on in the Bauhaus. I don't want to tell the whole Bauhaus story. 
But I do want to say that Bauhaus training from the very beginning was oriented toward producing what they called at the time new men. These were people who would be psychologically whole and multiply and diversely skilled in the Weimar Republic. When they arrived in New York, they took the aesthetic tools that they had used to make new men and made them available to promote the democratic personality. So here's an example of what I'm getting at. Um, so this is a diagram by Herbert Beyer. Herbert Beyer was a designer, very active in the Bauhaus, taught, studied there first, and then taught. Um, he's the one who developed the Bauhaus typeface you all may know that has no capital letters in it. And that was his creation. And he and others around the Bauhaus had a notion that images should surround the viewer so that the viewer could integrate them into his or her psyche. Now, we're very much in the habit of thinking of media in a Freudian sense. And certainly people who were theorizing mass media in this period were doing that too. Media beam in, they hit your unconscious, they stir you up. Bayer had a very different idea. He was a Gestaltist, and he had the notion that you should see holes you needed to be surrounded by a hole, take these images, knit them together into a whole gestalt in your own mind, and as you did that, you would become the new man. You would become psychologically whole in a way that the industrial world had challenged. You would no longer be the atomized mass self in chaotic Weimar society. You would instead become whole. Um, Bayer got to this um, via an exhibition that he staged in 1930. It's really interesting. There was a, an international design exhibition in Paris, France, um, household, housewares mostly. Bayer was in charge of one room in the German exhibition. And he took about a dozen Marcel Breuer chairs, um, which we all probably sit in today, the chrome ones with the little woven bottoms and backs, and he put them on the wall. He sort of attached them up on the wall. And you know, it sounds like you know, nothing at all, like a little innovation in museum design. But at the time, it was a huge shift. Until that time, museum design, exhibition design, with the exception of some Soviet constructivists, we can go there too, um, was really kind of a linear thing. Images were arrayed at eye level, and the job of the viewer was to walk image to image to image. This idea of a world in which chairs would be hung from the side of the wall, images would be at your feet and over your head, that was a very new idea. Bayer developed it to produce this thing he was thinking of as the new man. But when he arrived in the United States in 1938, he needed a job. Um, and he arrived at the Museum of Modern Art with a number of his colleagues. And the techniques that he developed for the extended field of vision in 1935 became the techniques that Steichen used in his first propaganda exhibition, the 1942 show Road to Victory. Herbert Bayer was assigned to design the exhibition um, by Monroe Wheeler uh, of, of the museum. And as you can see, it's a pretty innovative space. As you walk in, you encounter, these are, these are about six feet tall here. You encounter these enormous murals. You start to see them around you. You walk further into the show, smaller images at your feet, at the wall, on the sides. This is the immersive, multi-sighted, multi multi-image landscape of Herbert Beyer. Uh, it was enormously powerful at the time. Uh, when museum officials met in 1945 to review their achievements during World War II, this was the achievement they were proudest of, the Road to, the Road to Victory exhibition. 85,000 people came to see the show. Reviews were over the moon. Um, it was a show where people started with a landscape, walked into the exhibition, found themselves surrounded by America itself. The text was provided by Carl Sandburg, as it would be in The Family of Man. Um, it's, a fair, it's a kind of text that might be a little offensive to us today. It starts um, with a lot of rhetoric about how there was the land and the red man. Um, but it left the audiences at the time astonished. Here's what, um, let me find one, where did he go? Ah, there he is. Edward Alden Jewell of the New York Times. I think no one can see the exhibition without feeling that he is part of the power of America. It is this inescapable sense of identity, the individual spectator identifying himself with the whole, that makes the event so moving. For audiences at the time, the notion that you could walk into and through this space 
even if it was leading you down an ideological pathway, was still fairly innovative. Um, we might feel today, being much more used to environments like this, that this environment was in some sense controlling us. At the time, viewers experienced it very differently. So I want to um, give you a, a, a remark here from a woman named Elizabeth McCausland, who was a, a, a newspaper critic from Springfield, Massachusetts. She said, and this is a quote, the road to victory doesn't mold opinions because that word smacks of the fascist concept of dominating men's minds. Rather, it's a space in which people can move independently and individually, knit together images into a gestalt that makes sense for them, and thereby identify with the power of the state as a whole. Stress one other point here as we go forward, and that is the power of the state as a whole. You know, we're so used to thinking in media studies of what it's like to interact with one image on a TV screen, or on a wall, in a movie theater. But Bayer's design was such that the, the importance of the interaction was the movement from image to image. It was making the whole out of the parts that was the important piece. It wasn't simply the encounter with this image or that image, though of course that was powerful. Here we have Japanese administrators laughing at Pearl Harbor. That's bound to stir some folks up in 42. But it's the sense that we can move between these and make a meaning that is our own. And that's distinct from the fascist mode of meaning making. So let's jump ahead now to 1955, uh, about 13 years later. Uh, Edward Steichen is still working at the museum. Um, Herbert Beyer um, comes and goes. Uh, but his exhibition designs would come back. What's intriguing to me about this period, and I'm jumping ahead in the book a bit, is that the intellectual framework that drove the push toward these kind of immersive propaganda environments during World War II persists even though the Nazis don't. 1941, we had the rise of fascism and the fear of mass men. We thought mass media would literally make mass men. And against that vision, we proposed immersive multimedia or multi-screen media to promote a kind of character who could choose, who could select, who could move among images. In 1955, fascists were gone, but totalitarianism stayed. We had communism. We had, in 1950, the famous book, The Authoritarian Personality. There was a terrible fear that totalitarian nations were both built on and worked to create authoritarian citizens, very similar to theories of the masked man from earlier years. And against that, scholars like Gordon Allport, um, other psychologists, proposed a fairly detailed understanding of something called a democratic personality. Now, what I want to flag for us here is that questions of personality and character and of the state are entirely entwined in this period, even at the highest levels. So here's President Eisenhower in 1954 speaking up at Columbia. He says, the world, once divided by oceans and mountain ranges, is now split by hostile concepts of man's character and nature. Two world camps lie farther apart in motivation and conduct than the poles in space. That's really interesting. I, you know, I, I struggle to imagine a president today talking about the psychological character of the citizens of other states. Okay. That framework, in turn, brings Steichen back to the surround aesthetic. This is the central space at the family of man. Um, and as you can see, it brings back a lot of the techniques that Bayer had developed. Um, this, in this case, the designer is Paul Rudolph, who was trained by uh, Gropius, also a member of the Bauhaus, very familiar with Bayer's work, um, clearly imitating it here. You can see images in the traditional manner, images above, images oversized, images in the smaller space. Um, so what was this space? Hmm. Um, in the canonical telling, this is a story that you walk through where when you enter, you see a birth scene. You walk through the middle part, which this is, representing families. You leave, passing by an atomic bomb, old age. It's a story that maps Steichen's understanding of the life cycle. I want to argue that it's something else. What I'm going to show you in a moment is something you can move through much more freely than critics have acknowledged. But I also want to be very clear about who's in these images. So critics have tended to, to point to the fact that many Africans and people of color are depicted either in poverty or in rural African settings. 
The same, by the way, is true of American white folks, uh, generally depicted in Kentucky or Appalachia, um, very negative. In fact, I probably can't see it well here. Um, here is an Appalachian family in their coal mining home. Here is a polygamous African family. Here is an Italian farm family. Here is a Japanese farm family. Here is a Russian farm family. This is astonishing to me. In 1938, the Nazi primer, which is the handbook for Hitler Youth, and was actually published also in English and widely circulated in the United States, the first sentence of that book was, um, the foundation of the National Socialist outlook on life is the unlikeness of men, the disidentity of men. People were different. Characters were different. Characters were associated with different races. Races were different. And it was their difference that made the Nazi regime, the Aryan regime, superior. In the wake of that period, we pushed back with a far more humanitarian universalist vision. And here we have it embodied. Far from being an act of prejudice, I want to argue, this is a space in which our former enemies are depicted as being like us, in which people of color who are just about to push for civil rights very aggressively across the United States, even people with a polygamous kind of relationship, not widely celebrated and say, father knows best, um, are seen as equals to the spectator. And that's a very powerful statement. So this was a space through which you could move far more freely than we remember. The story, uh, this is out of um, popular photography. This is a map of the exhibition seen from above. The steady state story is that you start in the beginning and are forced to move through the exhibition. But as I think you can see, you actually have quite a lot of freedom. You enter through the entrance arch. This is a birth area. It's kind of hokey. There's a green, green sort of cloth screen there. And pictures of Wayne Miller's wife, um, who's had her baby in here. Um, once you leave that space, though, you enter that central arc. And you have a lot of choices about where you can go. Um, the themes here, I'm not sure you can read this, so I'll give you some of them. There are children playing, there are lovers, there are fathers and sons. There are photographs displayed on the floor, on the ceiling. The central area is called the family of man theme area, in which multiple styles of family are all brought together into one human vision. There are pictures of households and offices, religions, famine. <coughs> Finally, as you move out toward the end, though you can't see it easily here, there are two, two features to know. Um, one, up by where it says 30 and 26, you'll see walls that depict crowds. But unlike fascist imagery, or even North Korean imagery at that time, the crowds are not anonymous. Individual actors are um, cantilevered out from the images. So here's the wall, and there are a series of individual people pulled from the large crowd image and stuck out at an angle. So you need to spot the individuals in the crowd. It's impossible to see a mass in this space. Second thing that's important is right before the end, you have to, the one place you absolutely have to pass by to exit the room is an eight foot transparency of an atom bomb exploding in the bikini atolls. Steichen is terrified that the atomic bomb and atomic warfare are going to wipe out the human species. He wants you to encounter that and to understand that you are like these other folks. Okay. Finally, at the end, or let me actually read before I get to the end. Steichen and Miller also wanted the images to be mirrors. Um, these are some of my favorite pictures. The United States Information Agency was very carefully monitoring people's interactions with these images as they traveled abroad. So these are pictures from the archives in Washington of people interacting um, with images. And you can see the ways that the photographers are looking for mirroring. So this is an older couple in Germany looking at an older couple on the swings. See, honey, just like you and me. Um, here we have two women recognizing two women laughing at an image. Here we have a young girl seeing another young girl on the wall. Um, Munich, Paris, and Berlin, all from 55, 56. Seiken himself at one point actually hung a mirror on the wall. He pulled it down after two weeks because he decided it was hokey. But in the MoMA show, he really had a mirror on the wall for a while. And he said, I want people to leave this exhibition feeling as though they have seen themselves in the mirror. And again, that's quite a powerful thing to do, to offer particularly white Americans images of people of color as mirror images, former enemies, the Japanese, as mirror images. I mean, the Japanese were so loathed, I know my grandmother would never buy a Japanese car. Never. 
My other grandmother lost her brother to a Japanese bombing raid. The anger around that is so powerful, and yet here he is proposing that we see these folks as our mirror images. It was enormously popular. And you can see that he's promoting in many ways the mirrors of a much more diverse and tolerant society than the one that he was in fact living in at the time, or that other nations were living in. So this is in Germany, this is Munich, um, a young German family. Remember, this is what, you know, no more than 10 years after an entire nation had committed itself to racism, you have young German families asked to see themselves mirrored by Africans, whom they had seen as subhuman. Americans, too, could not escape an encounter with race or with otherness. For all their really cool 50s modern garb, they had to encounter those who were most othered in that period. So, um, the case I want to make is that the family of man and its multi-screen, many-sided effort to create a mirroring space is a site that represents a shift in how we do media power in the United States. Up until that point, and still in other kinds of media, we think about mass media as having that penetrating, directive, instrumental model of impact. But with the rise of these kinds of immersive multi-screen environments, we see a different turn. We see a turn toward the creation of spaces that, by comparison to these spaces, are enormously freeing. We are free to move about as we like. We're not locked in a chair staring at a screen. We're free to knit together meanings that make sense to us in gestalt of our own making, and not simply to absorb the messages that are being bullet shot out at us from mass media. We're free to view with our family, to talk things over. We're free to see kinds of people who we might otherwise not see, and to see them as being like ourselves. But at the same time, we are also invited to enter into a, a, a condition of power that Foucault called governmentality. In the fascist model of mass media, the instrumental model, mass media rule us at least in theory, by turning off our reasons and, uh, and lighting up our unconsciousness. They make us stupid together. This does something else. It frees us to be individual, to make choices, to see ourselves as being like others. But at the same time, it does so within environments in which the images have been carefully selected for us. We're given freedom of choice, but within a highly constrained space. We feel free but maybe we're not so much. And I'm hoping that that's going to begin to feel just a bit familiar. Um, so, start to sum up a bit. There was a shift, I think, in the politics of attention in this period. From a politics in which the concentration of the eye on a single image in a film or on the single sound stream of a radio was thought to produce an absorption, a psychological absorption that resulted in a breakdown of the reason, a rise of the unconscious, that was very much in keeping with the kind of psychological fractures associated with the rise of industrialization. And that was taken advantage of by fascist leaders who provided a kind of substitute organization through their own madness. As we pushed back on that, particularly in the propaganda efforts of the early war years in search of a search of morale, we developed a different kind of environment, and I can give many examples of other versions of this, I've just chosen one for today, in which we see movement across imagery being the important step, looking across images, not seeing a single image, but seeing an array of images all around us and choosing among them, remembering, of course, that choice is the fundamental faculty of the democratic person. Choice and empathy. So Harold Laswell, who has turned out to be one of my favorite people, God help me, um, media theorist, political scientist, he tried to define the democratic attitude at the time of the family of man. He said, the democratic attitude toward other human beings is warm rather than frigid, inclusive and expanding rather than exclusive and constricting. We are speaking of an underlying personality structure which is capable of friendship, as Aristotle put it, and which is unalienated from humanity. 
Such a person transcends most of the cultural categories that divide human beings from one another and senses the common humanity across class and even caste lines within a culture and in the world beyond the local culture. Though his language is kind of a 50s language, I hope that you're hearing his utopian ideals. He really sees a world in which we can, at some level, move at least beyond racism, if not beyond race, and at least beyond gender discrimination, if not beyond um, gender itself. Um, Laswell, as many of you may know, was, was closeted, um, and a, a very interesting, interesting figure. Um, so, selection among images, and finally, through the process of selection, the creation and integration of a self, psychologically and internally, but also externally into a world um, that by 1955 we hoped might be ruled in humanist terms by a humanized America. Now, let me go back just a bit to this mode of power. Um, for those who maybe remain a bit unconvinced by, by this analysis, I want to return to, a, to an essay that Barbara Morgan, who was a photographer in this period, wrote after she had seen The Family of Man. And she tried to explain what she thought had happened. And she was not alone in this. This is a fairly representative essay. She tried to explain what it was like to enter an environment of images in a mass media era. She says, here at The Family of Man, one is instantly conscious that this is no orthodox show of exhibition prints hung salon-wise. It's something for which we need a new term. Several have been suggested, photographic mosaic, three-dimensional editorializing, movie of stills, yet they all fail, too cumbersome, not accurate enough. She went on to call it a theme show, which fuses science, photography, architecture, layout, and writing into a compelling synthesis. And what's intriguing to me is that she's talking about the aesthetics of the show, but then she turns and talks about the psychology and the politics of its impact. In comprehending the show, the individual himself is also enlarged. For these photographs are not photographs only. They are also phantom images of our co-citizens. This woman, into whose photographic eyes I now look, is perhaps today weeding her family rice paddy or boiling a fish in coconut milk. Can you look at the polygamist family group and imagine the different norms that make them live happily in their society, which is so unlike, yet like, our own? Empathy with these hundreds of human beings truly expands our sense of values. And that's the utopian impulse in this period and the hope that these environments would make us whole and democratic people. Um, but here's the dark irony. Um, these environments have persisted. They're ubiquitous. They persisted through the 60s. Um, they were, you can find them in the World's Fairs of 64, 67, 70. This one a friend of mine sent me. It's a 2010 Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Once again, you can see a, a dome, people surrounded by images. Not a photo show, but people surrounded by images of themselves. And you know, on the upside, the family of man is a wonderful utopian pushback on the fascist world and on instrumental theories of media and media impact. But on the other hand, I think it's opened the door to a world in which we imagine that being free to choose among images selected for us by others constitutes freedom. You know, I, I think increasingly we inhabit a world, and this is just a rumination, I'm not going to hold myself to scholarly standards, we inhabit a world in which we're surrounded by images. Screens are everywhere, the jumbotron, the screen in the back of my car seat, the airplane seat. And we feel free. These media help us to, quote, become who we are. They help us connect and make contact with one another. In that sense, the family of man helped usher us into that world. But it also helped usher us into a world in which power was arranged by folks who set the stage on which these screens play. Um, and I think I'll stop there. And I'd love to talk with you about the politics of attention, get your feedback on the talk, and take your questions. Thanks.